Good morning, Bayside family. It's so good to be gathering with you this morning. If you are new to our church family, I just want to say a special welcome to you, and I want to encourage you to head over to our church website at baysidefamily.church and fill out the online connection card, and that way one of our pastors can reach out and connect with you. Over the past week, you may have noticed that the church parking lot had a few more cars in it than normal, and that's because church staff is now back in the building. And while this is a step in the right direction, we are not yet able to open our doors to the public. So we're asking at this time, you just refrain from coming into the church. But would you continue to pray with us for our leaders and for the day when we can gather together and worship together? Before we enter into worship, let's bow and pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we know that wisdom and power are yours. You change the times and the seasons. You remove kings and you raise up others. You are the giver of wisdom and knowledge. And today we humbly come before you and ask for your hand to be upon the leaders of our country. We ask for your hand to be upon Doug Ford and Justin Trudeau. Will you surround them with wise counsel and give them wisdom and discernment? Would you help them lead through this unprecedented time? But Lord, our hope is not in man, it is in you and you alone. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let my foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Lord, we also lift up to you those among us who are sick. We think of Alex Matthews, and Mary Porter, and many others who are struggling with their health, and we cry out to you on their behalf. We say with the psalmist, they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. Let's read together. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself in love. This is the word of the Lord. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name Into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken i am forgiven the King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, oh, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost. 
lost its grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope Then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declaring the grave has no claim on me then came the morning then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence pull the roaring lion it's clear the grave has no claim on me jesus yours is salvation in your name Jesus Christ my living hope hallelujah hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Good morning, church. It's nice to be with everyone again this morning. Last week, we had the exciting story of David and Goliath. Now most of you know that story, you'd heard it before. You knew the exciting story of how God gave David a great victory over the giant Goliath. One stone, one thunk, one dead giant. And God was with David his whole life. Even when there were other victories in his life, but they didn't happen as quickly or as easily as it seemed to happen with Goliath. So many years after Goliath, David sang this song about God. He'd been a shepherd boy and then he became king. He'd been a warrior. He was a leader. And he sang this song to show how he always trusted God. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verses 2 to 4. He sang, that means David, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my savior. My God is my rock, in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. He is my refuge, my savior, the one who saves me from violence. I called on the Lord, who is worthy of praise, and he saved me from my enemies. Aren't those wonderful words of trust in God to save you no matter what happens? And David never stopped trusting God. Even when things happened in a different way than what he expected, like our story today. This is the story of David and the other giant. Hmm, what's that about? Let's find out. This story happens many years after the battle, when David the shepherd boy killed Goliath the giant. David is now and he is much older. Those Philistines, though, they were a pesky bunch, and they continued to come back and attack King David's army, the Israelites, over and over and over again. Over the years, David led his men 
into many battles against the Philistines. They would fight and win battle after battle, but then the Philistines would come back and fight again another day. One day, when King David was out leading his men in battle and they were having a ferocious fight, suddenly, who should appear before King David but a giant over nine feet tall? And King David thought, here's a blast from the past. This guy looks familiar. But David knew God had caused and helped him to kill Goliath. So who is this giant? And he said, I am Ish by Benob. I am Goliath's brother. And I am going to kill you, King David. I will avenge my brother's death and the whole world will know your God is not real. And David fought him, but Ishbibenob was strong and powerful and fought King David and beat him up and knocked him over. And David fought some more, but the giant got up and fought him some more. And just when King David was weary and almost dead and he thought for sure he'd be a goner one of his mighty men Abishai, came from the battlefield attacked Ishnebena and got him out of there and won the battle that day King David King David are you okay are you okay oh thank you thank you Abishai, you have rescued me today. God has sent you to help me and cause me to be saved. I really thought I was a goner there. It's okay, King David, said Abishai. Everyone needs help sometimes. It's wonderful when God gives us the victory and deals with the giants in our life. But sometimes the same old things come back again. The devil fights us like that. We have to trust God every day for new battles and follow him every time. King David's men then came to advise him. King David, you are not a kid anymore. It is time for you to have a new role. We think God wants you to be king, to be wise, to lead us, and to seek God for wisdom. You leave the battlefield to us, King David. We will be your mighty men and God will give you wisdom. So King David left the battlefield to his mighty men and they went back to war and they found Goliath had more brothers. There was Saf, one of Goliath's brothers, and King David's mighty men destroyed him. There was Lamni, one of Goliath's brothers, and brought him too. And finally, the last of Goliath's brothers came. We don't know his name, but the Bible says he was a giant like Goliath, and he had six fingers and six toes on every hand. He had 24 fingers and toes, and David's mighty man got rid of him too. And King David sang songs of praise to God that he had rescued him and saved him from all of his enemies sometimes by using David to do it, and sometimes by using David's friends and soldiers. But King David never forgot that God wins the battles and defeats his enemies. Before Pastor Len comes to preach, I want to invite Abby Roos to read this morning's scripture. Good morning, church. Abby here. This morning, I am going to be reading from 2 Samuel chapter 21, verses 15 through 17. Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. And David went down, and his servants with him, and fought against the Philistines. And David waxed faint. And ish which was the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, succored him, and smote the Philistine, and killed him. Then the men of David sware unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. 
Good day, Bayside Family Church and friends. Thank you for joining with us. Thank you for the gift of your time. A special thank you to Abby for reading our scripture for us today. I'm going to ask you to turn to what Abby just read, 2 Samuel chapter 21, verses 15 to 17. 2 Samuel chapter 21, verses 15 to 17. And as always, I'm going to ask you to turn there now, but turn there again today and throughout the week and look at this passage of scripture. It tells us a story that many are unfamiliar with. Last week, we looked at the account, the narrative of David and Goliath, a famous narrative, a famous passage. Everyone inside the church and outside the church have heard of David and Goliath. Well, this week we look at the passage of scripture where David fights another giant, and that giant's name is Ishbi ben Nob. And very few know about this battle, David and the giant Ishbi ben Nob. And let's go straight to the point. David, when he fights this giant, loses. When David, when he fights this giant, uh, is in uh, danger of being killed, and he must be rescued by others. So, before we look at the scripture itself, and, and verse by verse, 15, 16, and 17, let's just set the stage a, a, a little bit. Some scholars believe that this passage of scripture happens uh, when David is older. Because it happens in, in the end of 2 Samuel, some argue that this must mean that David was an old man and he was enfeebled by age. But there is no indication in the narrative that that's true. In fact, what we have here is one of uh, David's uh, famous chronicles of war. This is David's exploits. And so the interesting thing for you and I is, as they are writing the exploits of David, they put into the narrative a time when David lost in battle, a time when David needed to be rescued in battle. And some uh, experts say, well, they, they would never write that. They would never show David weak because weakness means that you're, you, are, uh, you are a victim that you are no longer a conqueror. And that is absolutely fundamentally wrong. The scripture says, when we are weak, we are strong. Confessing our weaknesses or having weaknesses or needing to be saved by others is not a sign that we are falling apart. It's not a sign that we are, we are dying. It is a sign that we are normal and it's a sign that we are part of a family and we need brothers and sisters round about us to lift us up. So it is, it is so powerful for you, to, for you and I to realize that the Bible Bible shows David this time weak in battle or not able to overcome his giant. And hear me when I say this to you. There are some giants that we must face alone and God will give us the victory. He will do the battle, but he will give to us the victory. And there are other giants that we are not to face alone. There are other giants that I, in my life, that I am not supposed to be able to conquer. I need others in my life to conquer those giants. God has made you and I uh, giant killers for other people. That's the nature of the church. And so now in this narrative, David needed to be rescued. David the great king needed to be rescued by another. So uh, let's go to the narrative. But one last table setting we need to hear. 2 Samuel chapter 1 tells the story of four giants who are killed in battle by uh, heroes and men of Israel. Four giants. When we looked last week at David and Goliath, there was only one giant killer, and that was David. Now at this time in David's reign, there are four giant killers. And I need to pause there for a moment of time because this is significant. You see, the church is not supposed to have one giant killer. The church is supposed to have many giant killers. We all are giant killers. That is our role in the lives of others. And so I need to walk through this very carefully, uh, but I want to bring you this powerful truth that will enable you and hopefully inspire you and empower you to be who you are supposed to be. Pastor Dennis read for us Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 11 to 16. And there are two lines in that uh, dialogue, in that, in that writing of Paul, that I want to draw to your attention. Paul writes that the purpose of pastors and the purpose of teachers and the purpose of, of prophets are for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. Hear me when I say it to you again. The purpose of the pastor, the purpose of teachers, the purpose of evangelists, the purpose of prophets, purpose of apostles is for the equipping of the saints for the work of the service. So the role of the pastor is to strengthen the saint so that they can do the work of the church. The role of 
of the pastor, uh, amongst other gifted leaders, is to is to train the, the the saint is to is to train the everyday person to be a giant killer. That's the role of the pastor. Uh, Ephesians chapter four verse sixteen. Paul writes these words. He talks about the body is held together by what every joint supplies, what every part of the body, what every person supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part. Ephesians chapter four, verse 16, according to the proper working of each individual part. And so that means the role of the pastor, my role is to train the people in the church so that they can be giant killers. Now track with me when I say this, you are a giant killer. Some of you know it and some of you don't know it and some of you think absolutely not. My role as a pastor and the role of Pastor Dennis, the role of Pastor Beth and the role of, of, of Pastor Ryan, I almost said the other guy, the role of Pastor Ryan is to equip you and train you so that you will be giant killers. You will be the ones that do the work of the church. The old mindset is this, the pastor needs to do this, the pastor needs to do this, the pastor needs to do this. And I am not uh, having a, a grousing section about a, a, a session about my workload. What I'm saying is to be biblical, the pastors need to step back and equip and inspire and empower the church people so that they can do the work of the church. If it is only the pastor doing it, the church is not being the church that it is supposed to be. The pastor is not the only giant killer. There are many giant killers, and just do the math. One giant killer kills one giant. Four giant killers kill four giants. 200 giant killers kill 200 giants, and the church explodes in the way it's supposed to be. So we need to take this uh, professional mindset of clergy and, and push it aside. We're saying they are responsible for doing this, this, and this. I need the pastor to pray. Uh, yes, that's helpful. I need the pastor to give me insight. Yes, that is helpful. But you need to pray. You will be given insight. You have been given power. You have been given authority, and you have been given gifts that the pastor needs to help you uh, to, to marshal and, and, and to put together and to step out in faith in. You, my friends, are the giant killers. We are the trainers. We will train you and, and walk with you. We will fight giants and we will do our battles here, but our focus has to be to, uh, to uh, strengthen you and to put you into the battle in power. That's the rule. And so when I look at this narrative of, of 2 Samuel chapter 21, and I am excited about it, I don't see a, a degradation or a falling down of David. I see one giant killer uh, against the Goliath, and now I see four giant killers in his kingdom. That's not a dip. That's, a, that's, a, that's going up. That's power. That's the way it's supposed to be. You are the power of the church. The congregation is the ministers. The congregation is the one that make the difference in lives. And Satan wants you to, to uh, not know who you are. He wants us to stay in the tradition where, well, if the pastor doesn't do this, it's not done. And since the pastor didn't do it, well, that's a bad pastor. No, the job of the pastor is to strengthen you and to lift you up and encourage you, to push you, to pull you, to help you out, to equip you so we may be the church that we're supposed to be. And I am excited that our, we have a church full of giant killers. I am excited that when I get messages, I hear the battles that have already been taking place by you, the saints. But our role as we come back together must be centralized this. We train, you battle. We have our battles and 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 and, and we will be involved in those, but our, our main biblical call is to make you to be the giant killer that God has called you to be. Satan does not want you to know your identity. You, my friend, uh, you, my brother, you, my sister, you are powerful. And we have to channel, us, the pastors, have to channel our, our everything we have to get you to see who you are and then help you to walk in that, in that uh, place of power. That's our role. So finally, let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 1. Can you tell I'm excited? I am excited because God has whispered into my heart that this church is going to explode in power when people realize who they are. Oh, the pastor should have done that. Maybe, but most likely not. You should do it because you are the one called to be the minister of the church. Oh, be inspired, church, because we have greater days ahead of us than we have ever seen before. Well, let's go to our narrative. First, Second Samuel, rather, chapter 21, uh, verses 15 to 17. It begins with these words. There was war again between the Philistines and Israel. The truth of the matter is, that this place, this earth, this time, until Christ returns, there always will be wars. 
It will always be a time of battle. There will be no time where, where the enemy is dormant. There always will be a, a, a battle, a skirmish, a fight. That's the nature of this place. We are in a battleground. I was, I was raised uh, in a good family, and I uh, have on my desk at home a, a treasury of, uh, that was of Charles Schultz, Peanuts cartoons, that my mother gave to my brother and my sister and I. And for some reason, I, I have it, and, and uh, it's, it's one of my favorite books. In, in, that, uh, in that treasury, that, that comic collection, there is a story of little Sally, Charlie Brown's younger sister, uh, and she was all excited about her very first day of kindergarten, and she went to kindergarten on her first day, she was up early, uh, not like my grandkids, she was up early and, and, and went to school, caught the bus with Charlie Brown and, and had a great day. Well, the very next day in the next comic frame, uh, Sally's in bed and, and Charlie Brown comes into her room and says, Sally, it's school, you got to get up and go. And Sally says these words, no, 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 I went yesterday. I'm all done now. One day of kindergarten, and I fulfilled my commitment. What Sally didn't understand, and the, and, and the humor in it is that there is a long process of schooling going to take place for you, Sally. And what we need to hear is, uh, we had a war yesterday, we had a war the day before, and there are more wars coming. That is not abnormal. People say, what's wrong with me? There always seems to be a fight. That's right, that is this place. But what's wrong with you is you may not be fighting as the giant killer that you are. You might not know who you are. It is battle time, it is war time. There'll be another giant. Goliath was killed this day, Ishbi ben Na rose up that next day. That is the way of this place. There's coming soon a time when that doesn't take place anymore, but now is the time of battle. So our narrative begins with the words, there was war again between the Philistines and Israel. And it says, David went down together with his servants and they fought against the Philistines. And then verse, the end of verse 15 says, and David grew weary. David grew fatigued. David grew tired. Now, the Hebrew word for weary does mean simply that, tired and exhausted. But it, it, it also means uh, darkened or uh, 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 depressed or beaten down. And so there's a, there's a combination in, in that word of physical fatigue and, and emotional exhaustion and spent. Uh, there's, a, there's a thought of a, a nuance of just, just broken. Uh, he has nothing left. I need to say this to you. Fatigue is the great... A uh, weapon in the hands of our enemy. Fatigue uh, kills. Fatigue distorts everything that we see, everything that we do, everything that we hear. There is physical fatigue, and physical fatigue does that, but there's a, a mental and emotional and a spiritual fatigue th that does that as well. And we have to make sure that we are proactive in, in restoring ourselves. We have to actively seek a Sabbath where we can rest and, and be renovated in God's presence. Christ did it continually. He continually stepped aside from the action uh, to restore himself in the presence of God. But beware of fatigue. Be, be, beware of co being caught up in a loop, especially now uh, when we are shut down in our homes. Uh, if you don't schedule, if you don't program, if you don't proactively build into your life times of restoration, then fatigue will take you, your moods will change, and the enemy will exploit that, that darkness that comes just sim from simple tiredness. David grew weary. He did not, this day, have the strength to face his giant. And again, I need to say to you, I love the way that the Bible shows that even heroes have weaknesses. Even, even kings have, have, have times of need. David could not do this on his own. How does the church respond so many times? Well, we, we cover it up. We, we, we hide our weaknesses. And, and when we do that, we cut ourselves off from the true power that God has in our lives, the powers of brothers and sisters to come to our aid. David grew weary. And then the narrative be begins to speak about Ishbi ben Nob. He was one of the descendants of the giants. His spear weighed 300 shekels, um, about uh, some would say seven and a half uh, pounds, a seven and a half pound spear. And he was armed, and the ESV says, with a new sword. He was armed with a new sword. But well, the Hebrew doesn't actually say that. The Hebrew says this Ishbi Ben-Nob, this, this giant, was armed with something brand new. And it doesn't say what it is. 
uh, writers, uh, translators uh, supply the word sword, some put in spear, some put in club, some put in put in weapon, but it does not say uh, what it actually is. And I just want to just stay there for a minute, one moment of time. Uh, it's, it literally says, Ishbi Benob had something new. He had some new technology to take into battle. Something that people had never seen before. Our enemy loves to use the same old schemes over and over and over again. But if and when we finally do catch on to what he's doing, he's got something brand new uh, to attack us with. And we have to avoid uh, complacency. We have to uh, uh, avoid this uh, smugness or a sense of pride that uh, I have nothing to fear here. I know what's going on. I know what my enemy is doing. He has new techniques all along. And some of you won't like me saying this, but he is far wiser than we are on our own. And so that's why we need to make sure that we are walking in the spirit that we are empowered by the Spirit, that we are led by the Spirit. So when the enemy tries something new against us, we are protected by the power of God because we are in the Spirit. So this, this Ishbi Benob had something new that, that uh, no one had ever seen before, some advancement in technology. But that's not all that Ishbi Benob had. It says he had something brand new, 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 16. And it says uh, in the ESV, it says he thought to kill David. And he thought to kill David. Well, that English translation is just a, a, a little bit, uh, a little bit um, missing the mark. It doesn't say that he thought to kill David. It says that he was screaming, I am going to kill you. And there's a very interesting wordplay that takes place in the Hebrew. Whatever this new thing is, he is carrying, uh, the, the, the word in the narrative in the Hebrew is, is, is Cainish, Cain. And it's a, it's a wordplay on Cain, the first murderer. And so if you can follow me as we bunch this together, this giant is coming at David and he is screaming Cain-like murderous thoughts. I am going to destroy you. He is, he is, he is uh, vehement and, 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 and he, is, he is just lathered up and screaming these, these fearful attacks and murderous things towards David. Isn't that the way of our giant? And that is not something new. He always tries to paralyze us with fear. He always tries to unnerve us with his screams. He always tries to unsettle us, to get us to run and hide, or to get us to turn our back, or, or, or to get us to fall and, 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 and tremble at their feet. The giants always scream. <laughs> and that's why, my friends, you and I need the loudness of the church uh, in extravagant worship, filling our hearts and our minds, making memories of what true, what true power is in the presence of God. Right now, your, en your enemy, your giant might be screaming at you. It's a trick. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face, and the things of this earth will go strangely dim as you are lost in the glory of his grace. Ishbi Benob was screaming at David, I am going to kill you. And David was defenseless. King David was defenseless. And then the narrative says these words, verse 17, but Abishai, the son of Zariah, came to his aid and attacked the Philistine and killed him. Abishai, son of Zariah, came to David's side and killed him. You need to take a, a wander through the scripture uh, about this Abishai, this rescuer of David. <laughs> Hear me when I say this. And this might not seem too theological, but Abishai in the past had been a pain in David's side. When you track Abishai through 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, all Abishai wants to do is to kill. Uh, David, let me kill him. David, let me let me put him to death. David, let me let me hit him with a sword. I'm not gonna have to hit him twice, David. I'll kill him the first time. And Abishai is always on the move. He is a killing machine. And David came to a point about with Abishai and said, what am I gonna do with you? You are causing me so much problems, Abishai. You are a pain to me. You did, Kill, kill, kill. That's all you want to do, Abishai. And, and so the, the scripture narrative shows this tension between David and Abishai. Oh, man, I just wish this guy would go away. Settle down. Calm down. 
<laughs> David's opinion quickly changed when he's being beaten in battle by Ishbi ben Nob, and who does he see at his side? Abishai the killing machine. And Abishai the, Abishai the killing machine comes and slays uh, Ishbi ben Nob. Ben, he's dead, he's gone, it's all done. <laughs> it's amazing how God takes the pains of our past and uses them in our presence for his power. The things that you fought against or, 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 or was, a, was a thorn to you in the past, God is actually using them for your, for your freedom and for your, for your liberation and for your victory. Abishai was exactly what God needed. And God, or Abishai was exactly what David needed. And God had him there for such a time as this. Well, Ishbi Benob is now dead. David, the former giant killer, is still a giant killer, but he didn't kill this giant. And then the men of Israel turn to him and say, David, uh, verse 17 of our narrative, David, um, you shall no longer go out to battle with us lest you quench the lamp of Israel. David, you, we always did it this way. But we're not going to do this this way anymore, David. We are going to have other giant killers stand up. David, you need to change your role. Not because you are weak and not because there's something wrong with you. But David, we need to have a transition now in our battle. We need to change the way we think. We need to change the way we do things. David, we need others to rise up to be giant killers. And David, you need to lead us from a different way. In a different way, David. David, you need to change. Many of us don't like change but we live in a day and age where God is saying to us, he has something new for you and I to do. Traditions are great, and, and I, I love rituals, and I'm a traditional ritualistic person. But I know in my own life, God has been telling me, you need to change the way you do things. You need to, you need to uh, change the way you focus. You need to battle in a different way. And that's not a rebuke, and that's not a, that's not a, a failure. That's just a, a, a God's new, a, a God's wisdom for this new day that we are in. See, David needed to go back to the palace and David needed to, to release other giant killers. And so my friends, uh, I say to you that uh, maybe I am not supposed to be at the forefront of the lines. I will be there. Uh, maybe I, others, other pastors aren't supposed to be leading the charge. Maybe it's you, but we, are, we as a pastoral team are to be empowering this church to just go, for, go forward as these giant killers that you really are. David uh, needed help. Each one of us need help. Each one of us need to uh, be empowered in the role that we are, that, that God has given to us, so we can battle the way that we are supposed to. You know, if there's only one or two giant killers in a church, uh, limited role to pastors, limited to one or two elders, uh, in truth, that church is paralyzed. That church is, uh, has atrophied. That, that, that church is, is, is uh, uh, that church is busted up. Just because it might have always been that way doesn't mean it's supposed to be this way. I need to tell you, my friends, God is saying to this church, Bayside Family Church, at this time, you are giant killers. I need you empowered so you will go into the battle. And I do believe that our shutdown time, our, our, our quarantine time has been about us discovering our identity and us, us uh, making changes into our approach to the battle and our approach to church so that we can be a biblical church. Because this world needs to see that Jesus Christ has empowered giant killers to set people free. Our community doesn't need an inspired pastor. They need an inspired pastor with powerful congregation. And that's, my friends, who you are. And I will continually bring that to you. And we will, in these next months, um, do everything we can to get you to see who you are. Don't listen to the screams of the enemy. Brothers and sisters are there for you. I have much more to say uh, on this subject. But let's stop there and let me pray for you. But just remember, if there's a giant in front of you and he's too much for you, God has other people, brothers and sisters, who will fight that giant for you. Don't hide. Don't isolate. Don't fall down. Let the abish eyes, let the others come and fight for you. 
That's the true power of the church. Now let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, and I pray that you'll take these words that I have been given by the Spirit to this church, Bayside Family Church, and to our friends. And Father, that you would inspire each one that hears me to be the giant killer that they are supposed to be. Lord, they have so much uh, gifting. They have so much calling. They have so much to give and to battle, and the enemy does not want them to know who they are. Father, Show them today, at this moment of time, that they are giant killers. Show them that when they have fallen before a giant, it's not because they are uh, because they are weak, but it's because they are not supposed to stand alone. We are to be a band of giant killers. Lord, if there's a giant screaming right now, I come against it in the name of Jesus Christ. And I ask all those who are hearing me as I speak now uh, in their hearts to say, yes, Lord, Tear down every other giant that's out there that's attacking my brothers and sisters. And let us be a church of giant killers. Father, I pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen. God bless you. Soon, Lord willing, we'll be together. In the meantime, kill some giants, but don't do it alone. Do it as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm.